Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so for our first panel today, we're going to be looking at the EU Sustainable Finance Initiative, which everybody underestimates in terms of its impact, as we're going to hear this morning. Um, we've got an extraordinary panel for you today. And first of all, I'd like to introduce Caroline Lambert. Uh, Caroline is one of the stars at the European Commission on Sustainable Finance. She's been integrally, I mean, she's, she's blushing already. <laughs> but it's true, it's all true. Um, and she's been involved in it right from the beginning. Um, she's in DG Climate and a key part of the Sustainable Finance team. Um, Caroline has a distinguished history in the area of climate and climate finance. Um, before this, she has been in so many different roles. The Climate and Environment uh, Representative in Australia for the European Union, and also responsible for climate, tax and finance in two different cabinets of the European Commission, for Vice President Wellstrom and Connie Hennegard. Caroline, thank you very so much for being here today, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much to Baker Mackenzie for organizing this important event and also a timely event. And thank you for inviting the European Commission to speak. It's an honor to be here in Vienna in such good company. And it's a pleasure to be speaking about sustainable finance. Since I've been given the opportunity to speak among the first year today, I'd like to start by a few remarks about where we stand in time and space with regard to the Climate emergency, I'll call that, as a lot of leaders have now. Why is this going without me trying to move it? Um, ah, very good. We'll stay with the pictures for a while. So where do we stand in time and space? We are going to a three to four degrees war warmer world with business as usual. And this is a dystopian future. Already today, with 1.1 degree of global warming globally, 1.5 degrees in the EU, 2 degrees in Austria, it's already not safe. Last summer, the Arctic was on fire, Siberia was on fire, Alaska was on fire. Ice caps are melting, glaciers are melting, permafrost is melting, releasing lots of interesting viruses and bacteria, by the way. Hurricanes and storms have never been that deadly and costly, and this is coming earlier than science initially thought. Children born today are very likely the last ones to be able to see coral reefs. 24 million people are displaced due to weather extremes, climate weather extremes each year, and we're in, a, in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Yet, this is also the week where on Friday, millions of kids took to the streets to ask for urgent action. And on Monday, in the UN, 77 heads of states and government announced that they would bring their economy to net zero by 2050. 70 heads of state and government announced that they would ratchet up their interim climate mitigation target. And asset managers worth over 1 trillion euros said they would bring their portfolio to net zero by 2050. So it could well be that when we think back to September 19, in 10 years' time, we actually see that it was the point where, thanks to a tipping point in awareness raising and mobilization, we avoided a tipping point in climate change. At least in the European Union, we are reaching that tipping point of awareness raising and mobilization. The results of the last Eurobarometer show that over 90% of Europeans put climate action in at the top two of their priorities. And in fact, the stars have never been so well aligned for us in the EU, the European stars, so to say, to take strong, ambitious climate action as part of the new Commission's mandate under the leadership of President-elect Ursula von der Leyen. And it's not a minute too soon because we have about a decade to get climate change in control before all we risk trigger irreversible tipping points where uh, the destruction of current ecosystems is unavoidable. 
As we reach that crucial phase, the European Union can be proud of its achievements. We're standing by our Paris climate commitments. We're the world's biggest climate finance donor and development donor. We have overachieved our 2020 emissions reduction targets. We've actually reduced our emissions by 22%, while we grew our economy by 58%. We have the T20's most ambitious emissions reduction target for 2030, which is also underpinned by very detailed sectoral legislation. We have close to all member states agreeing to go to net zero by 2050, and we are now discussing, exploring how to ratchet up our 2030 targets to at least 50%, 55%, as announced by the president-elect. To focus minds and purses around the challenge, we've also asked member states to draw up national energy and climate plans. These make sure that everyone's efforts add up to the, global, to the common target, but they are also very important signal to investors. They are investment plans supported by a clear, strong policy signal. So let's have a look at what investment needs are. It's indeed 185 additional billion euros to reach the current 2030 target, but it's up to 250 additional per year to reach the 50% uh, targets that we are contemplating. And over 2031 to 2050 to reach net zero, it's about, oh, that's a total number, not an additional number, that's half a trillion euros per year that we need to be invested. Now, these are mammoth-like investment, but at the same time, on paper, from the macroeconomic perspective, it's in the cards. We, uh, there are savings uh, to be gained from this, and there's also the opportunity to reinvent the EU economy. Because we're not only fa uh, facing the challenge of climate change, we're facing automation, artificial intelligence, geopolitical tensions, resource scarcity. All of these challenges can be tackled at the same time if we transform our model, and that is the opportunity. Now, if we look at adaptation is another story. It's a subject of macroeconomic research of how much we need to invest in adaptation. What is clear, however, is that these are not nice to have investments. These are essential investments because this is the part of the climate story that we can change in the next 20 years. Even if we started, uh, if we em stopped emitting tomorrow, we would still be subject to increasing global warming levels for 20 years. That's the inertia that's in the system. And so uh, we absolutely need to protect our livelihoods during that time and protect people, nature, and assets so that we can safeguard the basis from which we need to reduce emissions. And it actually pays off. The, insurers, um, the insurance industry tells us that direct losses at the moment, not total economic losses, but direct losses from climate-induced extreme weather events is about two, million, two billion euros per year but it's uh, probably going to 190 billion per year by 2050. The flood that now comes every 20 years is, will come every 10 years. The heat wave that used to come every 100 years is now coming every year to every five years. And investment in prevention actually pays off. Rate of return for early warning system for floods, for example, example 10 to 1. Rate of return for resilience in investments uh, in infrastructure, that costs about 3% of a total of new infrastructure. The rate of return is four to one. So that's what we call the triple dividend in adaptation. You save, you avoid losses, you bring um, economic opportunities and innovation, and you have uh, important social and environmental co-benefits. And what are the um, source of finance for that? And I, I have, have a look at the public finance coming from the European Union in particular. And over the next financial framework period, 2021, 2028, we, 2027, we have um, said that we would have 25% of our budget climate relevant. That's just under 50 billion per year. We also setting up an innovation fund that comes from the homogenization of ETS allowances. So the actual size of the fund will depend on the price of the allowance at the time that is monetized, but we think about 10 billions will be available. And that will be to help develop, demonstrate clean technologies for emissions intensive industrial sectors. Think, for example, the cement sector, 9% of the world's global emissions, just like the EU's emissions, actually. 
or um, the steel sector, 7% of the world's global emissions. These are the technologies that we hope to be able to scale and demonstrate to that fund. And then we also have the modernization fund, also financed through the modernization of ETS allowances that will help the carbon intensive regions of Europe retrain their workforce, adapt their uh, energy system, modernize their energy system, invest in energy efficiency, etc. We also have what used to be called the Juncker Fund, and that um, is now will be called the EU Invest uh, Fund. Uh, initially, we thought it would be um, able to trigger around 650 billion for 2020 and 2027, but I now hear President-elect talk about one trillion, uh, so we'll see about that. Um, but it's, it's certainly uh, being upscaled, but I'm sure my colleague Willem will talk about that later. So now let's look at uh, that's you know, what we can do with EU funds. Of course, there are national public funds to add to that, and that's the whole beauty of the national decadal plans I talked about. What is there in a private capital stock to help us here? And what uh, caught our interest was the fact that, of course, there's huge amounts of capital, but 25% of that is in the hands of the EU asset management industry. And a large part of these assets are actually uh, managed by institutional investors, that is pension funds, insurance, and uh, a lot of it also directly comes from our deposits as citizens. So we, of course, saw this as an interesting policy-making opportunity. And we soon found out that there was not, uh, it was not imposing a foreign frame of mind to inject climate and environmental perspective into fi the financial sector. It's actually quite symbiotic. First of all, because of course, as the um, climate policies are tightening, it's extremely important that business uh, finds new opportunities and, new, and drives innovation around that. And it was the, the best way to do it is to create some signals for private capital since the beginning of the transition. The second reason is that uh, we wanted climate risk to be really mainstream into, into the financial sector's thinking. And what we found is that uh, many financiers are actually climate activists in grey suits. <laughs> if you uh, think of the um, declaration of the Bank of England, the Banque de France and the Dutch National Bank in April this year, where they warned of the possible climate Minsky moment of a sudden collapse of the price of carbon exposed and carbon intensive assets. Or if you think of the declarations of the European insurers when they say, when they warn us that there's a growing uninsurability of many assets in Europe due to weather extremes. So for the financial sector in the end, it's all a climate is just another risk to price in. Be it the transition risk, the technology risk, the physical risk, the growing litigation risk and the reputational risk. And I would like to end with that point, which is that we see through our polling that uh, citizens are more and more interested in seeing their savings, their pensions, uh, insurance money being invested in sustainable aims, for sustainable aims. And in fact, mill millennials are twice as likely as their parents to want to invest their resources in that way. As it happens, we're also about to see another tipping point, no, nothing less than the largest transfer of wealth in history, where the same millennials in the next 20 years will inherit 25 trillion euros when sadly baby boomers die. So on this bittersweet note, let's have a look at the, how we created the Sustainable Finance Action Plan. Less than three years ago, um, the European Commission appointed a high-level expert group to advise us on what we could do. Within the space of a year, they produced a breakthrough report where they said three things. First, the, the aim was clear. The European Union could help being the matchmaker between demand and supply for sustainable finance. But we had to do three things. We had to make sure that we brought transparency Incre increased disclosures and broad long-termism in the way the financial sector world works. The second thing that we had to decide on, on the list of what were these uh, sustainable economic activities to invest in. And the third was to mainstream risk within the way the financial system works, including the supervision of it. Within uh, three months, we produced a 10-point action plan, the Sustainable Finance Action Plan, and two months after that, we tabled three legislative proposals. 
and appointed a technical expert group, which we refer to as the TEG. The TEG uh, has been working since uh, to advise us on the more technical aspects of legislation that is being negotiated and has just before the summer, or in the summer, that was July, they published three reports that have been in public consultation. The consultation ended last week, or 10 days ago, and we are now evaluating with the tech the answers, and they're going to give us a final report in December about what they think we should do on a number of things. I'll come to that later. This is to explain a little bit how it all fits together, legislative actions, what the tech is doing. So on the left, you have the three legislative proposals. We've put forward a regulation to establish an EU sustainable taxonomy. We also put forward legislation on sustainability benchmarks and on clarifying institutional investors and asset managers' duties. The um, light greenish um, proposal is, is in fact a delegated act that is secondary legislation where we're revising suitability tests for financial advice. The TEG, meanwhile, has already produced a report that is not linked to any legislative proposals. That is the report on climate-related disclosure. And we've already acted on that report when we, in June, published updated non-binding guidelines for climate-related disclosures for companies that are caught by the non-financial directive, not financial reporting directive in the European Union. The TEG also produced two reports, one on the taxonomy and one on benchmarks that, we, uh, that have went into public consultation that we are now looking out with the TEG uh, with a view um, for them to refine their recommendations by the end of the year before we table secondary legislation delegated acts. And finally, the TEG is working on a non-legislative proposal, which is a green bond standard. Um, that uh, the report will also be ready by the end of the year and we'll see how to take this forward afterwards. That's the way the 10 action points are mapped across the whole investment chain, as you can see. We go from uh, the real, real economy, companies and projects, down to retail investors. And I will only talk to you today about the things in green because that's the time I have, basically. And those are the things we progressed um, the most. Taxonomy first. So what's the taxonomy proposal? The legislation which, uh, on which we had an agreement from the member states yesterday, but now it's not finished, they have to go and talk with the European Parliament now. The legislation aims to define what is considered sustainable for investment purposes. And it says that an investment uh, has to contribute to at least, substantially contribute to at least one environmental objectives out of six. So the environmental objectives are climate mitigation, climate adaptation, sustainable water and marine resources, the circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and the protection of healthy ecosystems. So you have to con substantially contribute to one and do no significant harm to the five others. Plus you have to comply with the minimum state safeguards. And the way that uh, all these um, are checked is through technical screening criteria, or thresholds, if you like, that apply to book, both substantial contribution and to do no significant harm. The TEG has been working on the actual thresholds, the technical, substantial, the te the technical screening criteria, and mostly advanced on, the, on mitigation sectors uh, and covered 67 economic activities in their reports, which they published in July. They are uh, from these sectors. And they have um, outlined three different types of activities that can be called sustainable activities. Those that are already low carbon, so that's the dark green niche, I would say. These are the electric vehicles of this world and the renewable, everything that is already there, already Paris compatible, I would say. And they've outlined also those that contribute to the transition, meaning that these activities are not yet net zero, but they are amongst the 10% more, most efficient or cleanest technologies in their field. For the ETS nerds, that corresponds to the ETS benchmarks. And the third type of category are enabling activities. So these are the um, economic sectors that produce the solutions, such as the windmills manufacturers or the installers of boilers. So who will use the taxonomy and how? This is important because uh, we hear a lot of, uh, there's misconceptions about that. It's not a compulsory investment list. 
um, it's only compulsory for those who want to market on the European market a financial product as green. And even then, it's not compulsory to use the taxonomy. It's only compulsory to explain how your green label applies to the taxonomy, taxonomy or not. So if you're not using the taxonomy, you have to say it and say what, how, how else is then environment defined in your financial product. And it also applies to member states who would want to put uh, on the market uh, new green finance labels. This being said, it is true that it's a cornerstone of a lot of other um, measures in the financial sector, and it's uh, also going to be used for further, um, further proposals. And it's also possible that it will be taken up voluntarily by other actors, in particular by uh, banks, for example, retail banking. So I'll take an example of how it is going to be used in another part of um, the financial uh, architecture. That's for disclosures. So as I said, we've published uh, in June updated non-binding guidelines on climate-related disclosures. These, are, um, these apply to the 7,000 or so companies in the EU that are captured by the non-financial reporting directive. And uh, these companies now have um, explanations of how we think it'd be good to disclose. So this is all voluntary at the moment. It brings into the European framework something new that wasn't there in the former version of the guidelines, and that comes from the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures recommendations. In the, in the, and that is the part where companies now have to disclose how climate change is affecting their business in terms of risk, but also in terms of opportunities. And the, we've also beefed up the part that was already existing in the guidelines, which is the part where companies report on how their activities impact the climate and the environment. We are encouraging uh, companies to report using the taxonomy when they report about their activities. And that's the first link with the taxonomies. And that is going to hopefully bring a lot more data in the market that will be needed for investors to know whether their investments can be taxonomy compatible or not. We've also uh, produced legislation to update disclosures done by financial, uh, financial entities. Um, basically, that is to make sure that everyone that invests on someone else's beh behalf or that give financial advice explain how they've taken environmental, social and governance concerns into account. We have been working on green bond standard. I'm taking this because it has an extraterritorial impact, a little bit like the taxonomy, because that would apply to um, bonds uh, marketed in the EU wherever the underlying economy's activities take place. And the tech is advising, advising us to, of course, align the green bond standard with the taxonomy, both in terms of activities finance, but also the use of proceeds. And they are uh, advising us to also set up a mandatory verification system with a central accreditation system for verifiers. Finally, the benchmark that legislation is passed. Uh, benchmarks are used by investors to monitor how their investment portfolio is doing, but it's also used for passive investing. So it's really important. And the legislation now um, creates two strong definition of what is a Paris compatible the Paris Align benchmark and what is a climate transition benchmark. Importantly, Council and Parliament have introduced something which we had not introduced in the, our proposal, that is the obligation for all benchmarks to now report how they relate to environment, social and governance concerns. So we, um, are, we believe that this will help mitigate greenwashing increase transparency, reduce market fragmentation, and make everyone speak the same language. It's important because although uh, green finance, in particular bonds, is still a very small percentage of uh, total bonds on the market, it's a growing uh, phenomenon, and so it's important to, uh, to get the vocabulary clear from the start. So what will happen next? We um, are expecting uh, the tech to finalize its work, and then we'll take stock and make our own decision at the European Commission and uh, issue table delegated acts, that is legislation that will contain the final thresholds for the taxonomy, uh, the final um, specifications for benchmarks, 
and we will set up as well a platform on sustainable finance which will be the uh, formal um, continuous body to advise us on these issues as the tech is uh, discontinued. So I'll now close, I'm uh, above uh, my timing allocation, just to say that indeed this is a colossal task that we have to deliver in terms of investments and in, in a daunting space of time. But at the same time, I think we can say in EU, we've taken a few springy steps and we've brought sustainable finance from what was really a niche three years ago to something that has the potential to be really transformational and where, where the EU is actually leading worldwide. We may represent only 9% of the world's emission, but our financial markets and our um, consumers weigh and punch much above that emissions weight. And we see in particular the taxonomy um, creating a lot of international attention. So we are about to launch an international platform on sustainable finance to enter into dialogue with other, other jurisdictions and try to see if we can align practices. I think it's fair to say that it's um, also, uh, that's a French thing, it's impossible to resist an idea whose time has come. And that's the case for climate action and for sustainable finance. Now the challenge is for us to go from mass awareness and mass mobilization to mass empowerment, which we're trying to do with that field of legislation, and to mass investments. And on this, you can help. So over to you. Thank you.